we're going to be talking about the Ecuadorian elections. I've addressed these before. Uh, that since February, I've been talking about them uh, on on a pretty as much of a regular basis as I possibly can uh, about these elections because what's going on in South America is really there's a lot of coups um, to kind of solidify neoliberalism and uh, get easy access to um, oil uh, and resources and they've been gaslighting uh, Venezuela particularly. Uh, I apologize for what's going on with my eye. Apparently, something has flown into my eyeball and is uh, bothering me. Okay, I'm going to try not to get bothered by that too much. Uh, hopefully, it'll sort itself out. But, um, yeah, what's what's going on in Ecuador is, is very much a... Uh, to, to try to solidify neoliberalism to try to, again, take another country's resources uh, and and how to, to basically make another country more beneficial for the United States. Unfortunately, the socialist that was uh, looking like they would win, and Andres Arauz, uh, lost to the conservative pro-U.S. coup, pro-Moreno banker, Guillermo Lasso. Now, there was a lot of shit going on behind the scenes that led to this victory, right? Uh, because in February, when they had their first round of their elections, Andre Arauz, um, it was a landslide. The dude fucking took the election. A lot of people wanted him. Um, he was bringing back Correa-style politics. And under Correa, uh, Ecuador's debt to the IMF was uh, taken care of. They they paid off their debts, so they were an independent country again. Um, you know, we'll, we'll watch a little clip from an elect election observer here. And, uh, what they basically said was, you know, he, he, there was a lot of, um, a lot of fake news going around about how Andre Aruz was going to de-dollarize, de de-dollarize, uh, there was de-dollarization under the Aruz, uh, leadership. That's what he was talking about, taking them off of the dollar, but, they had no plans of doing that. Um, he he realized that uh, there is strength within the dollar right now, and so to keep things on the on the dollar, he was a a major socialist. He was going to increase minimum wage. He was going to nationalize the oil. Um, he was going to drift away from uh, all the shit that Lena Moreno did, which was uh, uh, make a deal with the IMF again and dropping the minimum wage, just not supporting the working class of Ecuador. So Andre Arauz was basically going to undo all of that. He was going to, again, go back to Correa style politics. Uh, and again, Correa wasn't perfect, right? That was, that was something that I've, I've addressed. I addressed that in a video uh, way back in the day, as it were, where I talked about some of the issues with Correa. Uh, Correa clashed with uh, the indigenous folks quite a bit. Um, he would have, uh, you know, because they were pushing back on the notion of expanding um, fossil fuels. Um, so there was a pipeline battle with the leftist leader of Ecuador, and he kind of saw that Ecuador needed the oil. Um, so expanding the oil would mean that it would it would increase uh, social programs and benefit the people a little bit more. So he pushed back against the indigenous. Um, so that kind of left a little sour taste in people's mouths. But again, the indigenous folks seem to like Andres, uh, Andre Arauz because he seems to be picking up where Correa left off, but still uphold a lot of the positive things that Correa has done. Uh, in the February elections, he overwhelmingly won overwhelmingly and there was a lot of support on the ground uh for andre arauz because ecuador itself was looking for socialism they were fine with the social programs they were happy with the social programs uh it improved their lives it improved the conditions that they were living under and now guillermo lasso this guy like we knew he was a neoliberal with ties to the u.s uh, we knew that Lena Moreno was kind of banking on this guy, huh? Banker banking. Um, but there wasn't really a lot of major focus on him because what was happening was there was a uh, Yaku Perez, who was this fake eco socialist that was running with the indigenous 
uh, the indigenous political party, which is, I think, the second largest political party in Ecuador. There was a lot of focus on him, right? The Gray Zone covered it. The Mint Press News covered it. Um, so I talked about it quite a bit about Yaku Perez and how he's sort of the CIA plant that talks about environmentalism, but really is pushing for neoliberalism in Ecuador using uh, sustainable energy as, as a way to kind of push people into that. And he was talking down about socialism. He was talking down about, uh, you know, the indigenous leaders in other countries, the socialist leaders in other South American countries. He was disavowed by a lot of the indigenous community uh, across South America because of his tactics. Uh, and then he started calling for a military coup of the election because Andre Arauz won so, so, you know, overwhelmingly. But there wasn't a lot of focus on Guillermo Lasso. So I do want to play this thing that talks about what happened in the background that not a lot of people saw, uh, that not a lot of people um, addressed in, 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 in our media. I think Gray Zone talked about some of the things that were going on a little bit. But this really this this guy really talks quite a bit about what he saw on the ground and how it like affected uh the election. So where is this tab here? Okay. Okay, there it is. Let me know if you can't hear it. Leave a comment if you cannot hear the video here. My name is Leonardo Flores. I'm a Latin America campaign coordinator with Code Pink. So there was a group of seven of us here doing electoral observation. Um, we deployed to, I think, in total, maybe about 15 voter precincts. And really, we didn't see any major irregularities. I would say the vote was carried out uh, freely and fairly in terms of the voting itself and the vote count. Uh, and what we saw at the end of the day was a five-point victory for Guillermo Lasso, a right-wing neoliberal banker, over Andres Arauz, a progressive candidate. And we also saw roughly 1.7 million people decide to either vote blank or to spoil their ballot. Uh, so I think that was an important factor in this uh, election, given that Lasso only won by about 400,000 votes. So the spoiled ballots, I had to kind of look this up, is basically that's any ballot that doesn't even make it into the ballot box itself um, because it, the marking isn't correct or it's ripped on the side or something along those lines, right? Like that's that's what a spoiled ballot is. And he's saying 1.7 million people either just didn't, didn't vote for the candidates that were presented to them um, or you know, something went wrong with their ballot, like, oh, the marking isn't clear enough, or, you know, they they drew something on it, or something along those lines. Uh, now, there's also, th this next part kind of gets into the fact that, like, there might have been a chance that Andres Arauz might not even have been on some of the ballots, maybe, uh, because of the way that they, they, they did things. So uh, I, I want to show you guys this next part. That kind of shows you to how me, it's fucked very up clear this that is. there was an uneven playing field here in, in Ecuador. Um, I'll go into that in a bit. But also, there were, you know, the CNE didn't play fair, uh, especially before the first round of the elections. This was the second round of the elections. And when I mean when I say, what I, when I say that the CNE didn't play fair is that, you know, you had Arauz's political party was actually banned from running. It was Alianza País. So the CNE is their sort of their it's like their DNC and RNC. It's the it's the thing that watches over the elections, just like the DNC does. So that's what the CNE is. And he just said that Andre Arauz's uh, political party was banned. They were banned from running, uh, in the um, like they they just couldn't run as the as that political party. So, and they tried to form a new political party, and they were refused that option. So eventually they found a small party that basically let them borrow uh, the, the, the party as a vehicle for Andres Arauz to be able to run. On top of that, you had a candidate banned, Rafael Correa, the former president. He was banned from running as vice president. And his image was banned from being used by the Arauz uh, campaign. So, But not only that, they didn't actually ban his image from being used in a negative way by other campaigns. So it was very kind of one-sided. So again, this guy says... 
political parties banned. So Andre Aruz had to try to form a new political party, um, which would have taken an extremely long time and then wound up just borrowing uh, a small political party to run under. And, you know, so it's like you had a political party that existed with a following, with credibility, with name recognition, and then you banned that political party. The CNE banned that political party, much like the DNC uh, banned the Green Party in certain states, right? In certain states, the Green Party was not allowed to put Howie Hawkins on their ballot. So people didn't even know that the Green Party was running a presidential candidate in some states. Pennsylvania, my state, was one of those states. He was not on the ballot. He was not allowed. And they were trying to, to, to sue the DNC and the DNC pushed back. And then the election officials said, oh, this was legitimate. This was reasonable. You know, of, of course, uh, this is perfectly fine and fair. Of course, banning a political candidate from the ballots and not letting people know that he's even a political candidate is a legal thing to do. So that's why I'm saying there might have been the reason why people might have left ballots blank was maybe because Andres Arauz wasn't even on the ballot to begin with. Um, it seems like a lot of chicanery went on in the background there. So then banning Correa, similar to how they, and look, I'm not a Howie Hawkins fan, right? I've said that numerous times before. Uh, he just wasn't my cup of tea. Um, I, you know, being a labor organ, a lot of his policies I liked. I just, I just felt like his attitude was not what we needed. There was a lot of like, give me credit for this thing kind of, kind of thing. Um, there was a little bit of an ego problem I had with him. I thought Dario Hunter was uh, very similar platforms, a lot more focused on racial justice. And I thought that was, he, you know, more of my speed. He was a lot younger. Uh, I think he had a lot more compassion and empathy than Howie Hawkins did. But anyway, my point being is uh, Rafael Correa was banned very similarly to Howie Hawkins, where Howie Hawkins wasn't allowed to be on, on certain ballots he wasn't able to run as a VP. He was his image wasn't even allowed to be you. Can you imagine that in America? Like if they if if all of a sudden the RNC said no more images or even the DNC would said no more images of Bernie Sanders or you can't put Tulsi Gabbard on a poster anymore or, uh, you know, uh, name name an outsider can't, or, or you can't talk about George McGovern anymore. You know, you can't bring him up like this is this is censorship and authoritarianism and that's not a free and fair election it's just not that's not how you run free and fair elections and look the united states does this as well right they don't go outright to say they're they're going to ban certain candidates but they will use election manipulation in similar fashions like saying it's it like it's saying it's totally legal for a green party presidential candidate to not be included in the ballots um, and then and then justifying it by saying, well, you know, you can still write them in. You can still write that person in. We just can't put them on the ballot to give some people the option. You know, why would you let people make choices for themselves? Why not manipulate their choices so that they choose who we want them to choose? Right. Uh, OK, so this is this is the next part. Uh, on top of that, and Andres Arauz was only able to register as a candidate in December. Uh, so you had other campaigns had a four or five months head start. And then you had the role of the media, which is very clearly, you know, corporate media dominates here in Ecuador. And they were very clearly in the Lasso camp. Uh, we had a dirty, dirty campaign on the part of Lasso, uh, spreading fake news everywhere. I mean, initially, one of the big things uh, in terms of fake news was they claimed that Andres Arauz was going to de-dollarize the economy. Ecuador's economy has been dollarized for almost 20 years now, maybe a little over 20 years. Uh, and there's kind of widespread consensus that, you know, there are pros and cons to dollarization, but it's clear that dollarization has stabilized Ecuador's economy. And Andres Sadaus knows this. He studies this and he's an expert on this. And he, he never, ever suggested that he would be dollarized. We also saw. So I, before I get to the next part here, that's again, so it's a longer campaign cycle like it's not united states long um you know we're, we're talking about a couple months versus and, and versus like a year and a half 
to two year campaign uh, for 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 president in in America. Right. Uh, but again, he had two or three months less time than some of these other candidates. But even when he did come on the scene, by the time he was able to register in December, his message and his policies and his ideologies rung so true with the people of Ecuador that in the first round of the elections, it was a fucking landslide. So then they kind of fucked with his campaign in the back end. Um, there was a lot of media spear, uh, smears, which again, the DNC did to George McGovern in order to get Richard Nixon elected. And the DNC did that to uh, Bernie Sanders um to to get people to to not support bernie sanders anymore right and the, and i've heard a lot throughout the country of like oh well you know i like bernie i appreciate bernie but i just can't vote for bernie it's his 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 plans are too unrealistic right yes medicare for all universal health care oh so unrealistic that 32 out of 33 developing nations have been doing this flaw without issues for decades now right but it's too complicated oh in the united states we got these insurance you know it's just not realistic because we live in this world where we're all just uh just worker drones and and our health care needs to be connected with labor so that oligarchs can control every aspect of our lives down to what we do uh in our homes and down to how long we take a shower and how quickly we can masturbate that's 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 realistic in america now, again, I'm not a huge Bernie fan anymore. I, Bernie's been a, a, a bit of a disappointment, but using the media to create false narratives surrounding a candidate uh, is a page out of the American political playbook. They did this to George McGovern, you know, because the DNC lost its credibility when they basically came out in 1968 in the Chicago convention and said that, hey, we're just going to pick whoever we feel like we should pick for the candidate for president. And they, you know, they lost and they got people got pissed. So in 72, uh, they let the they went with the people's choice and the people picked George McGovern, who was an anti-war, pro-democratic socialist, uh, pro-universal health care, pro-worker candidate. And the DNC launched an offensive against him, creating a media spin cycle to tank his campaign. And they created the Democrats for Nixon campaign. So they were advocating Democrats to vote for the Republican candidate. Similar to what they were doing here. So again, they would run these false stories. So here's one of the ma here's one of uh, one of the major false stories that they ran against Andre Arauz. Uh, campaign electoral interference, really, from Colombia uh, when they. They disseminated this video of supposed guerrillas from the ELN, the National Liberation Army, a guerrilla group, that insurgent leftist group in, in, that's been operating in Colombia for decades now, uh, in which they claimed that the ELN had been financing the Adaps campaign. Uh, this, this, this video was debunked immediately by an ornithologist of all people who noted that you know the video couldn't have been recorded in Colombia because it was a bird that was only on kind of the Ecuador, the southern uh, border of Ecuador. And I mean, I think that's <laughs> I got to think that's awesome that a that a bird fucking debunked propaganda. That's incredible to me. A fucking bird debunks propaganda. Isn't that awesome? That's that's so amazing to me. I, 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 I love I love that that actually fucking happened. Um, so there, there you kind of see like how the false narratives are being spun by another country, right? Colombia, uh, which which has ties to the U.S. Um, they're they're spinning their own narratives and saying, "Hey, this guy's not legitimate because there's a guerrilla group that's you know sending money to, to to this guy." And that video was very easily debunked by a fucking bird. That's how loose and flimsy some of these propaganda tactics are. Uh, is that is that a bird can fucking undo it? So, I think a, a victory by, by Adaus would have really strengthened uh, the region's attempt at regional integration uh, during the so-called Pink Tide, which was this period in the early 2000s. You had when progressive government after progressive government took power in South America and Latin America as a whole, and the, and the Caribbean as well. You had these new institutions that were created, such as UNASUR, the Union of South American Nations, and CELAC, the com uh, Community of Latin American and Caribbean, St Caribbean States, 
These were meant to be sort of as a counterbalance to the OAS, the Organization of American States, which can really be understood as being a tool of the State Department to promote U.S. foreign policy throughout the region. Uh, una- so, again, there there you go, right? The, the, he talks about how uh, Arauz, being the socialist, would have strengthened uh, the the ties between various different South American countries, uh, from Bolivia to Venezuela to uh, to Colombia, Honduras, all of these countries, Nicaragua, uh, all of these countries would have would be more strengthened. They would be able to nationalize their resources, which means that the that America can't come in and uh, and steal them um, or or just lay claim to the oil under their under their ground like they're doing in the Middle East. Um, and it's and it's also why you know, uh, America wants to run coups. It's why they claim that they're a fake president of Venezuela is the legitimate president of Venezuela. Uh, Juan, Juan Guaido is is not the legitimate president of Venezuela because he wasn't legally elected and nobody in fucking Venezuela has ever heard of him. And most of the West and the UN agree with Venezuela. They, they say that these tactics are not good, that these tactics are uh, illegitimate. So, a socialist win in Ecuador would have um, would have very much improved the conditions um, in South America and probably prevented another coup. Now, I talked about how Moreno had undone a lot of Correa style politics uh, where, you know, you had more worker rights, you had more solidarity, you nationalized their oil. They were no, no longer in debt to the IMF and uh, and so on and so forth. But Moreno came in and undid all that. And Lasso is a Moreno style neoliberal, which means that he is going to um, he is probably going to uh, continue to decrease the minimum wage. He is going to uh, continue to, uh, you know, give in to more U.S. interference, that he is going to line up with U.S. foreign policy um, and he won't nationalize the oil. He won't help the people. There's going to be a lot more austerity measures put on there. There'll probably be, pro, you know, he'll be pro sanctions uh, on other countries. And we've seen how it, he'll probably be pro sanction on Venezuela, which we've seen uh, affects the people of Venezuela. And it's not the country's leader's fault. It's the country that imposes certain sanctions. Uh, that's whose fault it is. And not just that. Because of the way that we saw saw them attack Andrea Arauz's uh, political party, attack socialism, um, and and you know the the character of socialists, uh, we can see that there is a chance that he will criminalize socialism. He will criminalize certain thoughts. He will criminalize certain belief systems. Right? That's just what he's going to do, uh, because that's the type of person that he is. So. You know, with all of that in mind, the the w- w- what do we know about uh, Moreno and Assange is that Moreno, Lenin Moreno, is the person that sold out Julian Assange, which means that, you know, Ecuador, if, if Andre Arauz was elected, that means that maybe there could have been another asylum, uh, another attempt at asylum for Julian Assange. Uh, to protect him from U.S. extradition. Now I, they have a supporter uh, in U.S. extradition for Julian Assange, and that is, well, you know, that's going to be a major problem because they're looking to appeal the decision that the U.K. judge made, uh, where the U.K. judge basically said American prisons are such garbage that a person with de- any level of depression like Julian Assange would probably kill themselves. So as a mental health crisis, they can't put Julian Assange in prison. The United States wants to appeal this decision, and now they will have a new Ecuadorian president that will very likely, um, you know, support that decision and back them on the international stage. Uh, so this doesn't, this unfortunately doesn't bode well for uh, for Assange. But there is stuff on the ground. So we'll we'll, we'll, we'll switch back to uh, Leonardo Flores one more time. Uh, and and this is the last part of the video here where he talks about uh, some strategies that they can they can put forward to prevent a further neoliberalization of the country. A, a majority in the National Assembly. Andres Arauz's party has a plurality. The second biggest party is Pachacutic, uh, which also has left tendencies. Uh, so 
That was Yaku Perez's party, the Pachacuti. Well, I think there's going to be room for the left to fight back against this political persecution, but there is a lot of fear that uh, people related to the Arauz campaign are going to come under heavy uh, you know, pressure, and especially, and not just obviously the, the, the politicians, but the social leaders as well. So we have Jaime Vargas, who's the president of Gonai, the Confederation of uh, the National Confederation of Indigenous Ecuadorians. And he, you know, he was a huge leader in the October 2019 uprising. And he actually came out in favor of Andres Sarauz maybe about a week and a half before the election. And now there's a serious concern that Lasso is going to punish him and going to go after him. And, you know, one of the things that concerns me is living in the United States is, you know, we had the Senate Foreign Relations Committee issue this resolution in late March basically touting the relationship between Ecuador and the United States. And not only that, but saying that Lenin Moreno had somehow restored democracy in the country, when really Moreno did the exact opposite. He destroyed the country's institutions. He is, he's the one responsible for this, the beginning of this political persecution. And the fact that Moreno and Nasser are so tied, what it says to me is that Lasso is going to have basically uh, a green light to do whatever he wants here in Ecuador, and he's not going to face any sort of repercussions from the, unit, repercussions from the United States. Uh, you know, now, now on, since we don't have multilateral organizations like UNASUR and SALAC as strong, we're going to have to depend on institutions within the OAS system, like the Inter-American Court for Human Rights, to defend the the, the people who are going to be persecuted by the, the Lasso administration. And I'm not particularly confident that that's going to happen. So, uh, again, so this guy basically points out what we already kind of know, right, is... Uh, this 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 guy lasso is not going to get any sort of repercussions you know we're we're not going to see so similar to how the united states doesn't call any any human rights violations from saudi arabia is we're going to see the same thing because there's a beneficial relationship here um you know ecuador is going to be the gateway to try to push back against uh, Venezuela, it's going to be a gateway to push back against Bolivia and Nicaragua. It's, it, you know, they're, they're going to use this to smear more socialists. They're going to criminalize socialism in and of itself. And they're already doing that. I mean, they're doing that in the United States. If you are a socialist that talks about election integrity at all, uh, you will get punished. You will get kicked off YouTube. You put, get strikes against your channel. You can't stream. You can't do this. You can't get the messaging out. They will flat out shut down that messaging. And that's sort of the point. Right. And that's not uh, freedom. That's not democracy. That's not that's authoritarian. That's stuff that we're supposed to be fighting against. And and, and the sad part is much like Ecuador, which has been uh, 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 co-opted by corporate media. Uh, th people are going to be coerced into thinking that this is the right thing to do. They 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 don't have media literacy. They're controlled by a corporate media, uh, and they're going to sit there and look at this form of censorship. Look at look at punishing ideologies. Look at punishing people for the way that they think and the way that they want to live their lives and support the working class. And they're going to think that it's completely okay because the media spins the story that way. The media lies to them, and 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 the people that. Um, are pushing back against those lies and and spreading the truth and showing the reality of the situation are getting punished for it. So what do we do is I think, you know, it's important for us in the United States to uh, to make sure that people know the true story of what happened in these elections to to say that, you know, Guillermo Lasso was uh, was essentially plant, kind of planted do, through through various different manipulative tactics, using the media, using banning political parties, um, and so on and so forth, and to push back against the U.S. in their um, in, in essentially their expansive manifest destiny plans for South America, um, because we do have, the unfortunate thing with Ecuador now is that they have to go through the justice system that is. Uh, put forward by neoliberal economic policies, neoliberal criminal justice policies, much like in the United States, right? And and we have seen that in in most instances, when it comes to when it comes to crimes against the elites that side with neoliberalism, they get away with it. They're not going to be punished by it. Look at the bankers that ca caused the 08 collapse; they're not punished. None of the war crimes that Julian Assange revealed are being punished. None of the corporate crimes, none of the, the the clear violations of the American Constitution are being punished desp despite their crimes being revealed. And that's because the system is built that way. The system doesn't punish people that help the system. Uh, and Guillermo Lasso is going to be someone that helps your system. But 
you know, again, the the victories in um, in Bolivia and Nicaragua and and Venezuela and even um, the uh, pardoning of of uh, Lula in Brazil are all big things that we can say, okay, there is a foot in the door for us to build something better to push back against this level of neoliberalism. So I am hoping that some of those coalitions get stronger, and I am hoping that there is activism on the ground, and I am hoping that there is some pushback against this neoliberalism that has unfortunately uh, won out in Ecuador. Uh, da, 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 da. I'm going to look over. Ah, we got a few people over on Rockfin. Good to see you guys. Thank you guys for joining us over on Rockfin. Uh, rockfin.com slash Krishmohan. Ha ha. Uh, Prime Cat, thanks for tuning in. Uh, reading an RT article, they said that the third place, Yaku Perez, was a spoiler that previously supported Lasso. He got $1.7 million to spoil their ballots. Yeah, uh, I don't know if you caught the earlier portion of that, uh, of, of the video. There were, there were 1.7 million people that spoiled the ballots. Uh, the election observer did talk about that specifically, too. Uh, and, you know, I, I wouldn't be surprised. Yaku Perez was a big supporter of Guillermo Lasso and was calling for the militarization. Uh, and and uh, that would have meant that election observers uh, like Leonardo Flores would not be allowed in Ecuador to watch the elections to make sure that there is no um, there is no fuckery and chicanery. People left their ballots blank as well. That was part of the 1.7 million. Uh, so, you know, there there was a lot of manipulation in this election to to get Guillermo Lasso the W. But um, you know, it's it's kind of. That's the thing is like there is stuff on the ground. And I think our responsibility in the United States is to amplify these stories, amplify these voices and tell people exactly what's going on um, and educate people uh, about these sort of things. So, yes, uh, I, I agree. Yaku Perez uh, wasn't was definitely probably a spoiler uh, that um, that his support for Lasso was uh, created, created a little bit of a groundswell, uh, you know, so. Uh, yeah, I think that is that is accurate. Thank you so much for checking out this video. If you enjoyed this content, uh, please make sure that you hit the like button, hit the share button, and make sure you're subscribed to my channel, whether it's on Rockfin, YouTube, or Facebook. Especially Facebook and YouTube, they often uncensor people, uh, un unsubscribe people, and they censor this content. So if you want to keep up to date, make sure you're subscribed. Hit that bell button so you get notifications of when I'm putting up new videos and when I am going live. I usually go live uh, on uh, Fridays and on Mondays. Uh, and if you want more information about a, a bunch of the other stuff that I do, uh, whether it's my Forkful of Noodles podcast, the Taboo Table Talk interview podcast, or the Road Reflections live streams, uh, make sure you go to my website, krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A.com. There you'll find past episodes of, uh, of various shows that I, uh, that I do, as well as information about when I'll be performing live virtual comedy shows the forkful of noodles live virtual comedy shows uh the dates and tickets will be available directly on my website but if you're also on financial stable ground you can help contribute to the show financially by making a one-time donation or becoming a sustaining member which gets you free tickets and bonus content and go to krishmohanhaha.com slash donate to to make any kind of financial contributions but if you can't it's not a necessity most of my stuff is available for free and for everybody to enjoy. So again, go to krishmohanhaha.com. It's K-R-I-S-H-M-O-H-A-N-H-A-H-A. -H 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 -A, and I hope to see you at the next video.